everyone. So my name is Clarissa. I am an AmeriCorps member with Chicago Hopes for Kids. Uh, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat if you haven't already. So this session is going to be on the educational rights of students experiencing homelessness. And it's being presented in collaboration with Claire from Chicago Public Schools and then Alyssa, who is a lawyer from Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. So this is just a short little outline of the agenda for today. We're going to start with a brief introduction for Chicago Hopes for Kids for those who don't know what we do, as well as going into the definition of homelessness because it's a very important part of the McKinney-Vento Act. We'll go into more details about your rights under McKinney-Vento and the SPS, CPS STLS program. And Claire is going to discuss changes to CPS due to COVID and how to access additional resources. And then finally, Alyssa will present on what to do if your rights are violated. So Chicago Hopes for Kids provides educational support for children living in homeless shelters. It's our mission to provide our students with the resources and encouragement needed to succeed academically despite the challenge of homelessness. And these are some of the programs that we offer. So the after school program provides after school support. There's literacy support. We have STEM activities. We try to bring in enrichment partners and provide homework help. The family engagement program provides educational resources and workshops like this one that we are in right now. And then the summer program, which helps prevent summer slide for kids. And then also during COVID, we've done virtual and in-person school support to help support our students as well. So we wanted to give everyone the opportunity to ask questions before we start the presentation. You can drop your question into the chat. You can unmute yourselves if you feel comfortable. Um, and this will help us make sure that all the questions that you have are answered during the presentation. So we'll give people some time um, if you want to type them out. And then, yeah. Looks like people are still introducing themselves. And any questions you have, I'm sure someone else has as well. I think in the interest of time, we can just go ahead and move forward. Um, but if you all have any questions as we go through the presentation, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and then we'll have a good amount of time at the end um, to do kind of a QA and a um, or breakout rooms. We can kind of survey who's in the room and how we want to go about doing that. Um, but we will definitely have ample time for questions uh, later at the end. So the definition of homelessness under McKinney-Vento, it's defined as students who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence, which includes staying in transitional or emergency shelters, motels, hotels, or campgrounds, sleeping in cars, public spaces, buses. And most importantly, it includes students who are living doubled up or sharing housing of another person due to a hardship. So, an example of this could be if there's a family who's struggling financially and can no longer afford rent and they move into their cousin's apartment. And so this is living doubled up. And it's really important to note that the reason for love living doubled up is due to hardship. So there are many families who live in multi-generational housing and this alone is not living doubled up unless the reason they're doing so is because of hardship. And it's a really important aspect of the definition of homelessness because HUD, which is the Department of Housing and Urban Development, does not include people who are living doubled up as those experiencing homelessness. This means when it comes to programs and resources that these people get left out, which is really why, which is why it's so important that McKinney-Vento includes these students in their definition. So now Alex is going to go into more into about what the rights you have under McKinney-Vento.
I was on mute. Um, so really quickly, I just want to survey the room um, just to get a feel for who we have in the room to kind of tailor how exactly we do this. Right now, it seems like we have quite a few STLS liaisons um, and other advocates, as well as a few of our case managers. Um, I just want to double check and see if anyone from Cornerstone Community Outreach is here. Um, I know that they were planning on attending. I just want to make sure to check. Um, Okay, I don't see them yet. Okay, um, so the way that we're gonna conduct this is more just general information. So this is applicable to you know anyone who is experiencing homelessness, to anyone who might be advocating for someone who is experiencing homelessness as well. And so we're gonna take you through um, sort of a know your rights training. This is all based on the McKinney Vento Act, which is a federal act that gives um, students experiencing homelessness, their rights uh, around education. And so one of those main rights is the right to school of choice. Um, so one of the ways the act phrases it is by defining the school of origin. So school of origin um, can have a few meanings. The primary meaning is the school that the student attended when they were last permanently housed. Um, so let's say that a family was permanently housed in the Inglewood neighborhood and that's where their children were attending school and then they become homeless um, and they are moved to a shelter in Uptown. The child school of origin would be considered that school in Inglewood because that is where they were last attending when they were housed. Um, School of origin could also be considered the school that the student was last enrolled in. So let's say the family moves from Inglewood to Uptown, decides, hey, we want to enroll our students in the school in the Uptown neighborhood. Um, and so they're going to school in Uptown, and then the family is then moved to a shelter in the Austin neighborhood. Um, so that family now has access to, one, the school that the children attended before experiencing homelessness, um, as well as the school that the student was attending or was last enrolled in. Um, and then finally, families have the right to select the school nearest to their current residence. And we'll go through a little bit what that enrollment process looks like. Um, there are actually quite a few um, protections for students around a quick enrollment um, and trying to remove some of those barriers that families might see when they're attempting to enroll in a school. Um, but let's say that family, when they move to the Austin neighborhood, they decide, hey, there's a school across the street, we would like to send our children here. Um, they have the right to enroll in that school. Um, and we talk, when we talk about the importance of school choice, it really goes back to um, attempting to provide consistency for students. Um, and so on average, students who transfer two or more times throughout the school year fall behind an entire um, academic year in school. So keeping a student at their school of origin can provide a numerous amount of benefits, right? Um, you know, it's like if you start a new job, right? You go to your job, you spend like the first month kind of figuring out the culture, figuring out um, what your position is, exactly what folks are doing. Um, children have a similar experience at school, right? We know that all of our schools do not have the exact same curriculum. Um, teachers might teach differently. Some schools might be at different places and others. And so when a student is going to a new school, there is that transition period of, okay, who is the teacher and what are the rules in their class and what rules are different at this school than I might have had in my previous school. Um, maybe the student experiences in the classroom like, oh, we already learned this, um, or has the opposite experience of, whoa, I haven't learned this yet. Um, and they're at a completely different place than where I was in my old school. Um, and so there, those are just a few of the things that can cause a student um, to fall behind. And it's one of the reasons that we really try to advocate for students to stay um, in their school of origin as much as is possible. Um, so we talked a little bit of before about immediate enrollment. Um, so immediate enrollment means attending classes and participating fully in school activities. So this means if the family arrives at the school and says, um, hey, we wanna enroll our student, um, the school cannot you know, have the student sitting at the front office until they get all their paperwork in. Um, the student should be attending classes and participating fully in school activities, meaning that if there are sports um, or other things going on at school that they're able to attend. 
Um, school registration is regardless of the ability to provide records normally needed. So the schools cannot say, sorry, we can't enroll you. You don't have your immunizations. Uh, we need your proof of residency. We need a birth certificate. We need your transcripts from your previous school. Um, it is the responsibility of the school to gather that information um, in conjunction with the family. Um, so not to say that they don't ever have to turn it in, but um, it's not something that can be used as a, um, a barrier to enrolling the student in the school. Um, and then this goes for students who um, are both, you know, housed and experiencing homelessness. Um, schools cannot inquire about immigration status or request immigration documents. Um, so one of the barriers that might be posed when a family is trying to keep their student at their school of origin is transportation, of course, right? Chicago's a really big city. Um, getting from uptown to Inglewood can be very difficult. And so um, this is the McKinney-Vento Act covers transportation um, at all schools, but this slide is specific to the way that CPS handles transportation. Um, so CPS will provide transportation to and from school of origin, including all school related activities. So if the student um, is staying after school to play sports or for tutoring, um, that is included as well. Most of the time, um, what CPS will do is give the student and potentially their a family member a bus card. Um, so this varies based on the age of the student, um, you know, ability of the parent to accompany their child on CTA. Um, but the general rule of thumb is that if a student is in sixth grade or younger, both the student and the primary caregiver will receive a venture card. Um, so it's allowing for the parent to accompany their child on CTA to get them to school and to get them back. Um, for students in seventh to 12th grade, only the student receives a venture card. Um, but of course, there are exceptions. Um, you know, we know that not all parents are able to accompany their student or there might be other barriers in place. And so Parents can also advocate to get a yellow school bus if the parent is unable to accompany the student um, in sixth grade or below. And so that process um, we'll talk about a little bit later when Claire from CPS presents, um, but there's a form that families can fill out to um, get that yellow school bus service. And then preschool students with disabilities also qualify for transportation services. Um, waived fees. So part of what the McKinney-Vento Act includes is the student's right to have their fees waived. Um, this is regardless of family income. So specifically within CPS, CPS will waive some fees for students that are um, low income, but for students in the STLS program, which indicates that they are a student experiencing homelessness, um, their fees are waived regardless of family income. And they are also eligible for free and reduced lunch. So some of the fees that are included in this are uniforms, um, driver's ed, school records, graduation fees is a big one, um, field trips, sports, high school activities such as prom. Um, each school does have, you know, some of their own specific guidelines around, the, around this, but prom is one that generally is covered. Um, and then school supplies. So in a study done in Philadelphia this year, um, the liaisons at the school actually reported that school supplies was the number one thing that they supported students with. Um, so this is a really big need. Uh, this is something that Chicago Hopes for Kids also advocates to supply um, our students. Every year before the beginning of the school year, we pack backpacks and provide our students with a backpack with all the supplies. Um, but that's something that they can also receive from the school directly. And we'll talk a little bit later about exactly how to go about that. Uh, one of the other things that inclu is included is removing barriers. And so barriers must be removed that present students from receiving appropriate credit for full or partial coursework completed while attending a prior school. Um, they also have the right to free after school tutoring. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to highlight in light of the pandemic, um, you know, we've seen technology be a really big barrier for a lot of students, um, not just students experiencing homelessness. And so this year, CPS has really pushed to provide access to not only technology in the form of Chromebooks, but also to Wi-Fi for students. Um, and so there is a program called Chicago Connected. It's the CPS initiative to connect families to laptops and internet. Um, and so all families in STLS are eligible for free internet or hotspots. Um, we know that a lot of our families living at the shelters um, really will opt for the hotspots because it's something that they can take with them once they leave. 
Um, and so our organization has done a lot of work around um, trying to get families enrolled in Chicago Connected and getting them access to hotspots. Um, but the way that the families can do that is by reaching out to their STLS liaison. Um, we also included the number to the STLS department on this slide. And then if um, for any of you that are coming from one of the HOPE's partner shelters, I believe um, Phil, who is our digital program coordinator, sent out a form um, that can be sent back to get hotspots for any of the families residing in the shelters. Um, so really quickly, I just want to pause and see if there are any questions before we continue and I will be passing it over to Claire soon as well. Um, that's a great question. Out of state field trips, do students applying to charter schools have the same rights to enrollment as those going to neighborhood schools? Um, so yes, that is my understanding. Is that is the same? Um, it gets a little complicated within CPS because there are some charter schools that are backed by CPS, so they might have the STLS program specifically, and they're also independent charter schools. Um, and then out of state field trips. Um, so I will hand that question off to Claire when she presents. My understanding is that if it is like a, a trip to Springfield um, or a big class trip, it would be covered. Um, but I think Claire would be a better person to answer that question. Um, and so really quickly, um, before Claire presents, I just wanna provide a little backdrop on what the STLS program is. Um, so STLS stands for Students in Temporary Living Situations, and it is the CPS program that services children and youth. Um, so it's pre-K to 12th grade that are experiencing homelessness. And so this is the number one avenue that CPS provides for families to access their rights each school has an STLS liaison. Um, and so if you know, you're working with a family and they are recently experiencing homelessness and you're interested in getting and helping them get enrolled in this program, the first step um, is you can either call the STLS hotline, you can also call the school directly and ask to speak to the liaison. Um, and when Claire presents, she'll kind of walk you all through what that process is. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to you, Claire. Thank you, Alex. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, so thank you so much, Alex and Chicago Hopes for having me. Um, as was mentioned, I'm Claire Bowman. I am the resource and training coordinator with the CPS STLS program. Um, I will just first off address the question um, that came up about um, fees for out of state field trips. Um, the CPS policy, um, requires that fees are waived for all field trips that are considered customary. Um, and this is pretty much all field trips. So it's regardless of where it's to, how far. So eighth grade trips that may be um, going out of state or to Six Flags, um, you know, not just strictly educational field trips. Um, exceptions to that may be if there are um, trips that are being run that are not sort of for an entire class, um, maybe a college visit trip that's for 25 students and it's first come first serve. Um, and it's not something that would be considered customary. Those are the, the few types of trips that may not fall under um, that requirement to waive fees for field trips. But generally, um, that's going to apply to pretty much all trips that are being organized by schools um, for their students, regardless of the destination of that trip, um, and including if it is overnight. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the reopening of schools. Um, most of this information applies specifically to um, district managed schools in CPS. Some of the charter schools um, may be following a different schedule for reopening or have some um, different information that would be shared with their families as it relates to that. Um, but as you are likely aware, um, there are reopenings happening um, as we move uh, forward in the school year. So this week um, on Monday, schools reopened for um, preschool and pre-K classrooms, as well as for moderate and severe cluster programs for diverse learners. Um, and starting February 1st, all um, district uh, K to eight classrooms um, are being opened. The process for opening um, schools was that in the fall, families were contacted by the district to select their um, preference for opting in or out of the hybrid learning um, 
for specifically as it's opening for the K-8 students um, for the start of semester two. Um, so families made that selection and then um, classrooms are, are uh, reopening for a hybrid model for K-8 based on those responses. It's important to know that families can choose to opt out of in-person or hybrid learning at any time and return to a fully remote schedule. Um, but families who are engaged in remote learning can then opt into in-person for the fourth quarter, uh, which I think starts in April. I apologize, I don't have that um, date right on hand. And the way that this is working for the K-8 um, schools, these are reopening for a hybrid model of learning. So that means that um, students will be returning to their schools um, to be in person for two days of the week and have three days of remote learning. Um, these uh, classrooms will be operating in pods of students, so a small number of students um, that will be kind of restricted to only interacting with one another um, to reduce the opportunities for um, any kind of um, you know, widespread interaction with other students so that if there are cases um, of COVID that happen, um, it's easy to identify where exposure may have been limited to. Um, but all of the scheduling, um, kind of pod assignments and other hybrid learning details are being determined by individual schools. So if you're working with any families um, in the STLS program or experiencing homelessness that are um, returning to school, um, I recommend contacting their school directly to get those kind of details. I've also linked um, here, and this can be found on the CPS website, is the reopening guide for parents, which includes a lot of information um, kind of about what schedules may look like, um, information about um, health precautions, safety precautions, those kinds of things, um, attendance requirements, um, that can all be found in the reopening guide. Uh, you can do next slide. Thank you. Um, so just very briefly wanted to touch on um, some of the health and safety precautions that CPS has adopted. Um, this is not the full extent of those, um, but the ones that I think are um, kind of most visible and um, will impact students and families the most. Um, just wanted to touch on what that will look like. Um, so it is expected that anyone um, coming into school buildings is wearing face coverings for the entirety of the time that they will be there. Um, face coverings will be provided to students who do not have um, ones of their own. So no student should be excluded from school because they um, showed up without um, a face covering that can be provided by their school, um, you know, so that they, they don't have to return home or anything like that or, or provide their own if they don't have one. It will be required on a daily basis that any um, students and really any person who is entering a CPS building has to complete a health screener. Um, I've linked there to the health screener. Um, families also have the option to opt into a daily email or text message um, that would be sent so they can complete that health screener. Health screeners on a daily basis become available at 5 a.m. Um, and families are encouraged to complete that in the morning before arriving at their school um, so that that will be on file. And that's really just um, a very quick screener that is checking to, um, to see, you know, has the student had any symptoms, um, including fever, um, any change in their, uh, you know, sense of smell or taste, um, having um, cough, chills, those kinds of things that would be considered common um, potential symptoms of COVID-19. Um, so that has to be completed on a daily basis. It'll also ask about um, perhaps any uh, exposure that's known you know, to other people who may have been um, diagnosed um, or exposed to COVID as well. Um, if a student has had any symptoms or, you know, exposure and does not pass that health screener, they will not be able to attend school in person that day. Um, they will be asked to complete, um, to engage in school um, through remote learning if they're well enough or if they're sick, that then their parent would excuse them for the day um, because of their illness. Uh, anyone entering school buildings also is required to have a temperature check. Um, temperatures above 100.4 degrees um, will require that person to not enter the building. Um, if throughout the day there are uh, students who are displaying any symptoms, including um, fevers or high temperatures, they'll be uh, moved to a care room um, so that they can wait for their parent or guardian to come pick them up. 
Uh, classrooms are also being um, equipped with air filters um, and air quality assessments, and schools are undergoing comprehensive cleaning protocols and are equipped with hand sanitizer, um, you know, soap, water, some of those very basic precautions um, around hygiene that we can all do to help um, limit our risk of catching or spreading COVID-19. Next slide. Um, so STLS enrollment, so any student who is in a temporary living situation, so that includes, as Alex mentioned, um, you know, any student who meets that definition of homelessness, whether they're in a doubled up situation because they've lost housing, staying in a shelter, um, you know, maybe couch surfing, whatever it may be, um, you know, our goal is to ensure that all of those students are enrolled in the STLS program, um, because if they're not enrolled in the program, um, we can't give them access to the program benefits. And we've definitely seen um, you know, with remote learning that it's been really challenging to identify families. We know a lot of the, the typical um, things that, that we do to identify students that are um, experiencing homelessness involve um, visible signs that they may be displaying. Um, it may be some of the things that they're saying in those casual interactions that we're, um, you know, much more limited from having when in a remote environment. And so that's made it really challenging. Um, and we really do, you know, rely on the partnership and collaboration uh, with staff at shelter other community organizations serving families experiencing homelessness, um, as well as, of course, our STLS liaisons and other school staff to really be all kind of uh, on the lookout for any students who may be eligible. Um, students who are eligible, their eligibility is um, verified by their school's STLS liaison simply by just um, questioning them sensitively and respectfully about their living situation to confirm that it does meet that definition of homelessness. Um, there's no proof of homelessness that's ever required. They don't need to bring in eviction notices or letters from homeless service agencies that should not be required for a student to be enrolled in the STLS program. Um, and I've put up here the form that staff complete, which is really, this is what, what they're doing to enroll a family. It's documenting who the student is, what their living situation is, um, identifying that school of origin so that they can assess if they're eligible for transportation, um, as well as just a few other things. So this paperwork um, does have to be completed by school staff um, after they've verified eligibility of families. Um, so it's important that, you know, if you are working with any family that is in a temporary living situation, that they're getting in touch with their school STLS liaison to make sure that enrollment is completed. Next slide. Um, during remote learning specifically, enrollment into the program can take place remotely. So families do not have to make a trip specifically to the school to complete STLS enrollment. Um, liaisons can have those conversations to verify a family's eligibility and complete that um, STLS service initiation paperwork um, via phone or a Google Meets conversations um, you know, with a parent or guardian. Um, we also really encourage families to provide uh, multiple sources of contact. We found that, of course, in this time of remote learning, um, it's much more difficult to stay in touch with families if they're having changes in their phone numbers or email addresses. Um, and so we're encouraging staff to collect as many forms of contact as possible, um, and particularly encouraging staff to collect and for families to be comfortable sharing um, emergency contact information for friends or family members who may be in more stable living situations, um, so that if a family's contact information becomes inactive, the school has someone um, with a more reliable phone number uh, or email address that they can follow up with to, to help um, reconnect with that family um, enrolled in the STLS program. Next slide. Uh, so how can you help? This is really specifically targeted towards um, the folks we have on the call today who are um, working in shelters with families um, that have CPS students. Um, we really encourage um, you to work with all of the families in your shelter that do have um, students in CPS schools with contacting their school um, or the STLS liaison directly to request and, or confirm the student is enrolled in, in STLS. Um, STLS enrollment is required every year, so completing that paperwork, even if there's not been a change in that family's living situation, um, and eligibility has to be reconfirmed every year. And this is something that families don't always know. Um, so they may assume they were enrolled last year, um, you know, they, they signed the paperwork, 
work so that they would be enrolled in the program and be assuming that this year they continue to be enrolled, uh, while the case is actually that they do need to be enrolled again. So confirming um, that they are actively enrolled in the program for this year, if they are um, in a temporary living situation, whether they were enrolled last year, or if they are new to um, a temporary living situation as well, that's been um, a place that I think we are particularly struggling to identify families as those who have not had an experience with homelessness in the past. So they may not be on the school's radar as a family that needs STLS support. Um, so if you're working in shelters with families, uh, we really do encourage contacting the school, even if it's just to confirm that the family um, and the students are enrolled in STLS. Um, and really promoting the benefits of the program to families, even while we are in a remote learning period. Um, you know, I think a lot of the common supports that uh, families think about when um, thinking of the STLS program may involve the transportation supports, which during remote learning um, are certainly less relevant. Um, as well as those fee waivers, um, which a lot of schools have not been um, collecting fees from any families during this time because of the, the level of hardship that uh, folks are facing during the pandemic. So families may not um, really be thinking that um, enrolling is important or that there's any benefits or support that they can get. So we really do uh, want to encourage families to be aware of benefits um, that are available at this time. That includes um, access to the uh, MiFi internet hotspots that Alex men mentioned. Any STLS student is eligible for a MiFi device. Um, so that's a really huge um, you know, resource that can be uh, really critical to ensure that students can engage um, with remote learning this year. Um, and if they're in STLS, their school can provide them with that device. Um, there's no other eligibility criteria for that. Um, also having that connection with an STLS liaison um, can be important to, you know, have someone at the school that can help identify resources, um, help, um, you know, meet the needs that they may have. They do have um, funds at the school that can help meet some of the needs, such as school supplies, providing other clothing items, other things that students may need um, to participate in school that they're not otherwise able to access. Uh, working with an STLS liaison to make those needs known, uh, they can help often um, ensure that those needs are met. And also for families that are um, engaged in remote learning but maybe struggling, um, you know, with uh, you know, whether it's they don't have a, a safe and stable place for students to be logging on every day. Um, they may not, um, you know, parents may be struggling to manage the technology um, that's required. Um, but CPS is operating supervised learning hubs um, throughout the city where students that do need that supervision throughout the day um, can, can go and, you know, it's, it's not like a regular school day with a teacher, but they are supervised by trained um, community agency staff. Um, they're in a safe place. They've got access to technology um, and, you know, staff can then help them get logged on, those kinds of things. And if families are in the STLS program, those students are prioritized for placement at those learning hubs. So that can be another benefit um, to families of enrollment at this time. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, and Alex mentioned, um, remote learning devices are available for STLS students. This should include a computing device, a tablet, laptop, something like that, as well as that hotspot unit. Um, these should be provided for each student by the student's school. Um, so any students or families you're working with that do not have these and are in need of them, um, notifying the school's STLS liaison or just calling the school directly and making that known um, is really important. And if there are any issues um, with that, you know, schools are denying access to devices, um, maybe they don't have any in their inventory, or there's other barriers to that. Um, families, or if you're um, staff working with families, you can always contact the STLS uh, team directly, and we can provide assistance with that. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, transportation support. Um, so for remote learning, um, regular distribution of the CTA cards um, isn't available because students are not required to be coming to school on a regular basis. Um, however, if there are circumstances where um, a student or parent needs to get to their school, um, this may be because they need to pick up um, you know, remote learning devices, other materials. Um, if those kinds of things are required, uh, the school can provide CTA cards to facilitate that transportation. Um, and for those um, STLS families that are transitioning to um, hybrid learning, um, transportation support will be available. This will be for those STLS students that are transportation eligible, so they're attending their school of origin. Um, and CTA cards will be provided for um, those students for their, their in-person school days, uh, which will typically be two days per week. Next slide, please. 
Um, I also want to uh, mention the grab and go meals, um, even as our K-8 schools um, do uh, return to some amount of in-person learning as the hybrid um, learning does launch. The grab and go meal sites that have been available since we transitioned to remote learning uh, will continue to operate. There may be a couple um, changes to hours or exactly which sites are offering those, but the um, CPS school meal site uh, webpage, which you can put in any address in the city and it'll give you the, the nearby um, meal sites to that location that will stay updated so that you can get information on that. Um, families do not have to pick up meals um, from the school that their student attends. They can go to any CPS meal site um, and they will be able to access meals from that um, location for any of their um, students um, in their family. And any family that is struggling to get to a meal site, um, maybe they have um, you know, barriers to actually getting to the site itself. It may be that a, a parent is, you know, working during the hours that those um, that sites are operational. Uh, you can always contact the CPS command center uh, by phone or email and request home delivery of those foods. Um, so anyone working with STLS families, we encourage you to, um, you know, make sure that they know where their closest meal site is, if they've changed locations, helping them identify um, the closest meal site to their new place of residence so that they have um, easy access to that resource. And I think that's the end of my slides. Yeah, so I've shared here our program contact information. Um, our helpline is a great direct way to reach us. Um, you can leave a voicemail. Those will be returned 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday or email our general information line. Um, or you can contact a member of our team directly. Um, our citywide coordinators, Ms. Phillips and Mr. Summers, are great contacts um, if there are um, questions or issues related to specific schools or a specific area. Um, they kind of cover the city geographically. Um, so Ms. Phillips covers schools um, in networks one through seven or 14 and 15, which is the Northwest and central eight parts of the city. And Mr. Summers covers um, the South and Southwest um, areas of the city. Um, and they're always available to help um, answer questions or manage issues that may come up um, with schools or families um, and are happy to be available for that. Great, thank you so much, Claire. That was very informative. Um, I know there have been quite a few changes, so really happy we were able to highlight um, some of the new initiatives that CPS has during this time. Absolutely. Um, and so I wanna hand it over to Alyssa Phillips, who is a lawyer with the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless's Law Project. Um, and Alyssa will talk a little bit about the dispute process um, and how, a, how to go about supporting families in that. Hey, everyone. Um... Yeah, my name is Alyssa and I am an educational rights attorney. Um, my email is on that first slide, so definitely feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And you can go to the next slide. Awesome, so um, just a little bit about the law project. Um, so we assist families and youth experiencing homelessness with um, any issues around school, so enrollment, uh, discipline, if there's any questions, um, access to transportation, fee waivers. Um, we also help a lot with medical insurance, like public benefits, um, food stamps, Medicaid, SSI, um, and access to identification documents. Um, so I know sometimes those can be barriers to accessing school, um, so definitely feel free to reach out. Um, and we provide um, civil and some limited criminal legal services to families and youth experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. Go to the next slide. So um, throughout this presentation, um, you know, Alex and Claire talked a lot about rights um, and Clissa about rights that are given to students. Um, so sometimes there are disagreements between the school or the family. Um, and those disagreements can be around whether, um, you know, the family, um, sees the whether the family feels like the school is doing and following all the rules and giving the rights and resources that students are entitled to um, there can also be disagreements from the school maybe they you know believe the family is homeless but um that school isn't what isn't um you know their school of origin or the local attendance area school or um there can be a whole wide variety of issues that come up um, so the federal law requires every state to have what's called a McKinney-Vento dispute resolution process. 
Um, so we're going to focus on Chicago, but in um, Chicago Public Schools Policy Manual, um, they discuss what the dispute protocol process looks like um, and what exactly, you know, the rights are for families and students um, going through that. So a dispute can be brought up by a family and a dispute can be brought by a school. Um, so if it is something that's brought by a family, there's a form that's on the STLS website um, that is fairly simple where you can explain kind of what is going on, what your dispute is with the school that revolves around um, issues of homelessness and accessing the rights and resources. Um, one thing that's really important, um, if a dispute is brought by a school, um, the school needs to provide the parent and guardian with information about the dispute and what's going on. Um, so they need to include a letter um, that really explains what the issue is, what the school believes to be happening, and then the rights of parents. Um, so, you know, parents are allowed to have a legal representative um, at a meeting. They're allowed to ask for what's called like a pre-dispute hearing. Um, so a lot of disputes in CPS, as well as kind of in Illinois as a whole, they get resolved before going through the formal dispute process. Um, and the reason for this is usually when there is a pre-dispute meeting, when the liaison and the family and the school principal kind of talk, um, they usually can get clarity on what's going on and, and resolve the issue. Um, so it's definitely really important to make sure that, you know, if um, there is a dispute that families are aware of what their rights are, um, because it is a big deal, right? If you go through a dispute process and the family loses, that means the child doesn't have a right to go to that school. Um, so you want to make sure the family is aware that this is, you know, a big deal, that they get the support they need, that they understand what's happening and what the school is claiming um, to, to happen as well. Um, and also for families, that they know that if there is an issue at the school, that they have the right to, you know, to bring that up and get some resolution. Go the next slide. So um, I just wanted to also talk about um, another really important right is that students who are in a dispute process, if the school brings a dispute, they must remain in the STLS program and with all the rights and resources connected to that. So that means that during the dispute, the child is still enrolled in school. They're still um, attending classes. They still get, you know, transportation services um, and fees waived and, and all the rights that were talked about earlier in this presentation. So until the dispute is finalized, nothing changes in the child's status. Um, and that's really important because um, you don't want to have a child out of school during this time, and families need to be aware that if the if the school tries to tell the family, um, you know, we're going to have a dispute so the child can't come to school, that that's not um, correct. And um, that that would be something that would need, you know, to be addressed by the SCLS department um, because the child should be should remain um, enrolled through the entire the entirety of the process. Um, so if there is a dispute that com comes up, as I said, um, there is not as many anymore as a lot of them do get settled um, before that process. You can definitely feel free to reach out um, to me. That's something that we can assist with. I also would recommend that if there is, um, you know, if, a f if you hear from a family that, you know, maybe the principal made a comment about not believing their status as homeless or someone in the school made a comment and, and the, the um, parent kind of tells you about that, definitely reach out to the STLS department, reach out to um, Claire and other folks in the office, reach out to the liaison at your school, because um, I think a lot of times it can be a miscommunication that can be, you know, resolved without having to go through the formal process. And so making sure, you know, you're updating schools on um, the current living situation. Um, I know sometimes what does happen is if a family maybe is staying at a shelter and then they start living doubled up, maybe they don't always communicate that to the school. Um, and then that can cause issues. So making sure that, you know, the families are keeping schools up to date, um, where they're staying and addresses, um, and that that, you know, communication and relationship, relationship building is happening um, 
to kind of prevent those disputes from occurring. But if they do get to that place, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, on the slide, it had my email. That's the best way uh, to get a hold of me. And I would be um, more than happy to talk, talk through it with you. Great, thank you so much, Alyssa. Um, so we are going to transition into um, some time for Q&A. Uh, we also have planned an opportunity to split folks into breakout rooms. Um, it seems like the best way to do that might be by neighborhood, um, but we can figure that out um, after the Q&A. So please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, you can drop any questions you have in the chat. Um, if you have, you know, someone specific that you would like to answer this question, please let us know. If not, we can kind of just um, field questions amongst the three of us. Um, I have one question that um, Claire or Alyssa's might be a good question for you, um, but I recently had one of our partners ask um, if you all had any advice for working with families who are hesitant to enroll in the program, um, maybe don't want to enroll for reasons of, um, you know, not wanting folks to know that they're experiencing homelessness, um, and kind of how to navigate that conversation with the family. Yeah, um, so I think one thing that's really important is the language that you use. So um, we always mirror whatever language the family uses. So maybe if they're not comfortable um, identifying as homeless, saying McKinney Rental eligible, saying, you know, that you're in a, a transitional housing situation or an unstable housing situation or a temporary housing situation. Um, so using that language um, instead of using the language as homeless, I think is helpful. Um, I also think really emphasizing the benefits that come from being McKinney Vento eligible. Um, so talking about, you know, the transportation and school fee waivers and access to, you know, tutoring and um, kind of other communal supports. And so kind of focusing it more on, you know, the benefits that can come. And then I think also, you know, if parents have fear, I know we get a lot of parents who get afraid of like DCFS involvement. Um, really explaining that, you know, it doesn't automatically trigger DCFS involvement, that it's, you know, the schools have an obligation to keep this information confidential, um, and that it really just is like a service. Um, and I think kind of explaining that can be helpful. And I think also really explaining that it can help keep the child in their same school, um, even if, you know, there is transitions, I think is also a big thing in like the academic um, benefits of keeping children in the same school. Um, those are kind of the strategies that we, we use. Yeah, I, I don't, um, I think I echo everything that Alyssa said, um, kind of stressing the benefits, not necessarily um, using the word homeless in describing the program, um, you know, because that doesn't capture necessarily everyone's um, sort of experience. Um, and then, and really just assuring them that this is private information that, um, you know, schools should be keeping confidential. You know, the, the STLS liaison will know of the student's enrollment, the principal will know of the enrollment, um, but certainly if they don't wish that any other staff in the building are aware of their enrollment in the program, um, you know, they can let their, their school know that to really stress the importance of it. It's always protected information that no staff should know um, without having a reason to know. And that reason should be that they're providing um, you know, enhanced support and services to the student, um, but it otherwise is not something that should be, you know, widely known or shared. Um, and simply, you know, if they're, if they're enrolled in the program, even if there's nothing sort of that they immediately see will be a benefit to them. Um, as Alyssa said, if they've had a change in their living situation, um, you know, really rapidly, they don't have to disrupt their students enrollment, they can stay enrolled at their school, access that transportation support right away, um, and without delay so that those are those are just some of the benefits. Um, um, you know, of that. And, and, and definitely they're, you know, simply experiencing a temporary living situation is not cause to report to DCFS. Um, is that definitely is a concern as Alyssa mentioned. Great, thank you. Um, so I will leave another minute or so. Um, doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat. Um, so I'll leave some time if folks want to unmute themselves and ask a question. Um, and if not, we will just move into breakout rooms shortly thereafter.
Okay. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is Zoom has a feature where folks can select their own breakout rooms. Um, so we're going to try it and see if it works. Um, I've organized them by neighborhoods that Chicago Hopes for Kids specifically partners with. Um, so if you're an AmeriCorps member, please feel free to go um, to wherever you've most recently volunteered. Um, for our STLS liaisons, um, please go to the neighborhood that you either serve or maybe a neighborhood that is closest to where you serve. Um, if you are a community volunteer, if you volunteered in one of these neighborhoods, um, I would recommend choosing that one. Um, and if none of these neighborhoods really are you know, relevant to you, uh, maybe just pick a neighborhood closest to where you work, um, where you live, where you may be volunteering, um, where you may come across a situation where uh, you might be able to apply this knowledge and building that connection might be of use to you. So I will open all rooms. Um, do you all see the option to select where to go? Yes. Okay. Um, so we'll probably, we'll spend about maybe eight minutes in breakout rooms. Um, and then I drop the questions in the chat. If you all just want to introduce yourself, what brought you here, one thing that you'll be taking away and any additional questions you might have. I'm sorry, where are the breakout rooms? I don't see them. Um, so it should come up on your screen. If you want to just um, tell me which one you'd like to go to. So the options are Uptown, Lakeview, Austin, Inglewood, South Chicago slash South Shore and Rogers Park. I can also move you. Inglewood. Okay. Yeah, and if other folks are having trouble, if you want to just drop in the chat, I can do that for you as well. Clarissa. Mm -hmm. It looks like some only have one. Yeah, so it looks like Lakeview, South Chicago, South Shore, and Rogers Park. Mm -hmm. um, so Brittany, Monique, Valerie, and Montanya, do you have a preference of where you would like to go? I'm in Inglewood, but whatever's closer. Yeah, it doesn't matter to me. I'm sorry, Brittany, can you repeat that, please? Uh, it doesn't matter to me. It's okay. fine. Um, let's put... Uptown. Okay, I think I'm going to move Francis to Uptown. Mm -hmm. And then... It looks like Austin is just Rita and Todd. Um, there was someone in the chat. Austin is closer for Monique. Um, yeah. Deb, you were the only one in Rogers Park, so I'm going to put you in Uptown. And then Valerie. I'm going to move Nora to Inglewood. Valerie in Austin. Valerie Uptown. Perfect. Okay. okay. Then we can broadcast the questions. I wonder if we should move Rita and Todd. We could. It kind of seems like there's two groups now. Yeah. It seems like it's going to be more of like a south side, north side. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Did you remember Monique? I did. 
And also set a timer for eight minutes. Um, and then I want to broadcast the message again. I did move Lenny. Yeah, she mustn't have accepted. Her. Yeah. Um, okay, do you want to jump in Englewood and I can go to Uptown? Sure. Okay. You're able to join, right? Mm, yes, how do I? So I can assign you. I guess we're um, so um, it's very challenging. How are, how is your program going when that, that you see these uh, these families? Um, I can talk about this past semester. We were in person through most of November, and then we went virtual. Um, so we were in person seeing all of the families and all of our kids. Um, and then doing after school in small pods. Um, yeah, virtual is very, very hard. And even just in person doing virtual schooling with them is very, very difficult. Um, a difficult thing to balance being in person but doing virtual tasks with them. Um, I don't know if Nicole has any feedback as well about how um, our program has been going at CCO. Yes, um, to piggyback off what Taylor was saying, especially when we went all virtual and we stopped with in-person programming, I think what we had maybe a total of four days where someone came in for a brief moment and was back in classrooms, so we didn't have a lot of in person or a lot of school support during the day. So it was kind of hard for us to know their progress. We tried to make a sheet of what needed to be turned in, but it's a lot to try to um, keep up with, with the students and the parents. And then after school programming, it started off kind of busy and then it just dwindled down. Like Tuesdays we had seven kids, six kids in program and then by the end of it we have like one or two kids come join us. So all virtual has been pretty difficult. Thank you for that. We kept losing you in and out, Miss Nicole. That's I think we got the gist of what you've been, how you've been supporting. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, the challenge that we have as you know, at my school as a parent resource advocate, I always step into teachers and see what the challenge was during the pandemic of, of um, virtual learning and remote learning and how they how these how these uh, social workers or these uh, you know the at, at CCO, how did they support those students when the parent was just not on, you know, on, 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 on with it, uh, I should say, or just how did they, how did you find that support? I'm sure it was a lot because you had so many students that you have to, you know, especially in that, in the facility, 
um, how do you make sure that each student is on remote learning in the morning and in the Google Classroom on their, on their device? Was there a specific time? Did you have to do a check-in with these? Because you know attendance is a big thing with Chicago Public School, and that's what they that was a, a big challenge as soon as we went remote. How did that work for you, Nicole, and your and your peers there? Yeah, um, at CCO we had all the kids come up to another floor, so that we were all relatively together in different rooms. Um, Interesting. Well, that's really, really helpful information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but then is that then because of remote or because of charter? It's because of remote. There's oh. nowhere for them to transport. They're supposed to be working at home. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so once we get are... back in person, they will have access to transportation. Yes. Okay, that's important. Yes, know. they get transportation. And their children have, the daycares are getting services that the state are providing them with for doing remote learning there. Interesting. So are they guaranteed access to the charter schools? I mean, I know that there's other eligibility requirements for the charter schools. So Nora had asked a question earlier just about like how that would occur if, if you had a student who was looking to gain access to a charter school. Um, it's only guaranteed if the seats are available because under our contract with CPS, we can only take so many per grade. So if they if they if the seats are open for the grade that they're looking for, we can take them. Thank you, very helpful. No worries. The other thing that kind of came to mind if we're just discussing was in the second part of the presentation, um, it was very interesting to learn about settling disputes with schools. And she mentioned briefly discipline. I know in our line of work, working at the temporary, uh, like in a temporary shelter, we've had issues before with excessive suspensions and if the students just being suspended to remain in the shelter during the day where they can't be supervised, the parents at work during the day, I know that kind of, I'd be interested in learning more about resolving the dispute process for um, discipline within schools. One real easy, quick thing that I'm taking away is just the annual application. You think that like once you're in the system, you're good, but it's like, no, 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 you gotta do this once again. Very true. Yeah, I mean, it can be easy to lose sight of that, but nah, like. I also wonder how like uh, basic like attendance disputes over during this time with uh, like teachers saying students are on for not the whole time versus parents saying they've been on their computers this whole way. Uh, I wonder where that falls. So good to think about. Okay, I'm gonna head back to the main room and I'll see you all there. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, really quickly, I just want to share the rest um, of the presentation and then we can get on out of here. Um, so here's a quick summary of all the things that we've discussed. Um, feel free to take a picture of it. This can also be found on the Chicago Hopes for Kids website. Um, and I believe this is on our Instagram page as well. So just a really quick recap of all the things that we talked about. Um, and then here's some additional information. Um, here's Alyssa Phillips' email once again. This is my email address. Um, please feel free to reach out. And then this flyer on the right is specifically what we've distributed to our partner shelters. Um, and so we have a phone number they can call for assistance. Um, we have a QR code to our website, which has some really great information on resources families can access. Um, and then finally, uh, please complete our feedback survey. We'll include this in the email as well, but this is like a really quick plug um, with the QR code if you wanna do it right now. Um, but yeah, that is all that we have for today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I know Alyssa and Claire had to log off early, but you know, would like to thank them once again for attending. 
I think it's always great when we can come together um, as an organization with CPS and with the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless um, to just connect. Um, we're all serving the same folks. And so I think the more connections we can build amongst our community, um, the better we can do that. So thank you so much for your participation and have a great rest of your day.